Um, and we're going to turn together to our New Testament reading, which is in the Gospel of John, chapter 4. A well worn and familiar passage of Scripture, a much beloved passage of Scripture, which is the encounter of Jesus with the Samaritan woman at the well. like to read the first 19 verses to you. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 19. This is God's word. Therefore, the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples. He left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, Now how is it that you, being a Jew, Ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as well as his sons and his livestock. And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. And Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. This is God's word. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 15. I would only point out to you from John 4 that when the woman finally asks Jesus to give her the water that he's speaking about, that he exposes first her sin. He exposes her sin. Well, we're going to finish Exodus chapter 15 today. As we uh, left off last week in verse, uh, we finished verse 21 and are now going to pick up in verses 22 through 27, which I will read to you now. Exodus 15, 22 through 27. This is the word of God. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and they found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them and said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all of his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elim, where there were twelve wells of water and seventy palm trees. So they camped there by the waters. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we look to you uh, for all of the help that we need, all of the strength and power that we need in order to take your word and to benefit from it, to have um, the eternal blessings that you have promised to your children, that you would impart impart those to us. 
today we look to you and to your word and and we know that you feed us with your word you give us drink from your word and so we ask father that you would make us hungry and thirsty for that which you give and we ask it in jesus name amen We've seen in the United States of America that for several generations now, uh, children, young people, teenagers, have been taught that if they are, have any chance at succeeding in life, they are going to need a college degree. Um, and perhaps that's the reason why there's some 43 million Americans today who carry roughly $1.5 trillion in federal student loan debt. Uh, I can remember being taught this, though, when I was in high school, that uh, uh, in my junior year, there was an upcoming college uh, fair at Gonzaga University uh, in, uh, just across the border from where I grew up in, in Washington, and I was told that I needed to go to this college fair. I needed to go. And so my friend Casey and I, we said, hey, we're going to, let's go. If nothing else, we'll get to uh, walk around the campus at Gonzaga, which is pretty. Um, we got there. There were like 300 different colleges represented at this at this fair, where all of the colleges have their booths set up, and and they there they their representatives tell high schoolers walking by why it is that they need to go to their school and and how it's going to change their lives. Um, and what I remember most about that uh, my time there was how uh, I left with a bag full of these shiny beautiful brochures, all of these uh, uh, pictures of sprawling campuses and stately buildings and, and park-like settings on which uh, a, an impressionable high schooler like myself would look at and say, ah, I need to go there. This looks like the place. Um, and my friend Casey and I, we, I remember as we left the fair that day that uh, we, were, we were filled with anxiety, truly. Um, we had we had gone. We, we we left with this thought that we just had to go to one of those distinguished colleges on one of those fancy brochures. We just had to. I just we coveted the thought of spending four years of our life on one of those beautiful campuses, and we were we were convinced that, that going to one of those campuses would be a, akin to winning the lottery. And uh, we feared that uh, what would become of us if we didn't get a degree from one of those schools. Our teachers had told us that there was nothing more important to our futures than getting a college degree. But, but Casey and I didn't want just any degree. We wanted a degree from a university that would make us look prestigious and enviable to others. It wasn't until several years later while I was still mourning the fact that I, I didn't make it to one of those schools, that uh, several years later, after I came to know uh, the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, um, that I learned that He had already enrolled me into the most prestigious school on the face of the planet by saving me and by adopting me as His child. The Lord had enrolled me in what some of our forefathers have called the school of Christ. The school of Christ. And as we see here in Exodus 15, it is the school that the Lord leads all of his children into once he, once he saves them, once he puts that new song of deliverance into their hearts. And that's where we left off the people of Israel last week, right? They are singing, they are dancing for joy. They're on this spiritual mountaintop with the Lord, and no doubt they believed that they were going to go straight into the land of promise. I don't doubt that they were convinced that they were about to go straight from God's grace into God's glory. But that's not what the Lord had planned for them. Look at verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. Now, in case, you, young people, you're wondering uh, what this wilderness was like, look at the rest of the verse. What was this wilderness like? Well, they went three days into the wilderness, and they found no water. And so, the next big trial, the next 
big test begins. Now, we have to remember as we read this passage, what, uh, again, what I men- mentioned to you last week, uh, that Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, he says that these things that happened to the children of Israel in the wilderness, these things happened to them as an example to us. Now, the, the Greek word translated example in 1 Corinthians 10, 11 is the Greek word tupos. Tupos, it's, it's the Greek word from which we get the English word type, type. Now, as Paul uses the word tupos, it, it means it, a, a tupos is a, a model or a pattern uh, for something else. So when Paul says that Israel's wilderness experience are a tupos for us, he is saying that what we learn, in, uh, what we see of the wilderness trials of the children of Israel, what we see, what we are seeing there is a model or a pattern. And it teaches us, then, the way that the Lord deals with us, too. It's God's pattern. It's his tupas. So John McKay is right to conclude, then, that what is now happening here to Israel in the wilderness is just God's normal way of working. It is that we, we are entering into glory. It, entering into glory does not immediately follow salvation. Rather, there is a time of preparation to make his people ready for what lies ahead, for the, for the inheritance that, that he is going to bestow on them. Ma- McKay says, free indeed they were from the hand of Egyptian control, but they had still much to learn. They were therefore led into times of difficulty and testing so that their spiritual faculties might be developed through use. And so it is that the Lord leads his people into times of difficulty in testing. Is the Lord doing that to you now? Has the Lord been doing that to you? Have you been experiencing that? Is, is, has he been leading you through them, perhaps, even now, trials and troubles? Have you wondered, where is God at in the midst of all of that? Where is he at? Are, are, you, are we even aware, perhaps, that, that he's even teaching us something? Is that on our radar when we are going through trials and troubles? Are we thinking that, oh boy, the Lord's at work here? Are we thinking that way? Well, let me show you from this passage that these difficulties and testings are not some strange thing, as Peter says it in 1 Peter 4. It's not some strange thing when we are tried and tested. No, they are simply the way that the Lord lovingly teaches his children to follow him by faith. We could say it like this. He he enrolls us into the school of Christ. How? By taking us into a wilderness of trials and testings. Now, Charles Spurgeon described is Israel's wilderness experiences as the Oxford or Cambridge for God's students. He said, there we go to the university and he teaches and trains us. And so it is, if you are a child of God, before you enter the land of promise, you will get a degree from a very prestigious school. You will take your degree from a school that is without peer, and it is the school of Christ. And the first lesson we learn here then from this tupas, this type of our education that the Lord is giving to us, is that it is the Lord who leads his children into times of testing. I just want to make sure that we see this. Don't read verse 22 and conclude that Moses was the one who was shepherding Israel through the wilderness. It says that Moses brought them through the wilderness. Yes, but as we saw in chapter 14, verse 2, it was the Lord who was giving Moses the directions. And we have to remember, of course, that there is the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire that are going before the people of Israel. It was merely Moses' job to teach the children of Israel that what they must do, what they ought to do, is follow the Lord through the wilderness. 
Now, Psalm 77, uh, verses 19 and 20, uh, they describe for us the way that the Lord led Israel through the wilderness, and they describe it like this. Uh, Psalm 77, 19 and 20 say, Your way, Lord, was in the sea, your path in the great waters, and your footsteps were not known. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. It, so it is the Lord who is shepherding his flock through the wilderness. Yes, he's using men to do it, just as he does today, but the Lord is our shepherd. And this confirms that it was the Lord who was bringing Israel through the wilderness where there was no water for three days. That means it was the Lord that made the children of Israel thirsty. That means it was the Lord who led them to the waters of Mara, the waters that are called bitter. Now you have to get into the history a bit here, the, the story, young people. You need to get into the story. And imagine for yourselves that you're traveling through the desert and all you have for water is the water that you can manage to carry. Now they did not have horses, they didn't have mules or, or camels with pack saddles on them. Uh, they had sheep and goats, and you know sheep and goats are not pack animals. They, they don't, you don't raise sheep and goats to, to pack things around for you. And, and so this meant that the people of Israel, the children of Israel, likely had to carry their own water. And water is refreshing, but water is not light. A gallon of water weighs over eight pounds. And what this means is that the average person would have been hard-pressed, would have been hard-pressed to carry more than three days' worth of water for him or herself. So what does that tell us is going on here in these verses when we're told that for three days they went without finding in the, any water? Well, it tells us that by this point, they are probably getting quite concerned. I think it's fair to say that most of us would have been in a complete panic at this point. But just then, you see a pool off in the distance. And what a wonderful sight that would have been. Your fear that people were going to start dying there in the wilderness is, is relieved. Now you can, you can turn to your children and you can tell your elderly parents that everything's going to be all right. We just spotted water up ahead. And then we get to the shore of that pool and you lower your jug down to fill it with that life-sustaining water. But there's just one problem, young people. What the, what's the problem? The water is undrinkable. We're told that the water is bitter, which means it was likely filled with minerals, probably with salt. We call this kind of water brackish, and it's the kind of water that if you drink it out in the hot sun, not only will it not refresh you, it will kill you. You cannot drink this water. This water was bitter. And so you saw that pool of water as the natural solution to your problem, to your present crisis, but now that natural solution has turned out to be no solution at all. And your first terror-stricken thought likely would have been, now what are we going to do? Have, we, have you ever said that before? You ever asked that question before in the midst of, of a crisis in your life, now what are we going to do? The crisis Israel experienced here at the bitter waters of Mara, it's a, it's a model of the kinds of crises that we face in life too. I don't have to name them for you. You, you know what your crises are. They could be financial in nature, right? The loss of a job, an investment that goes bad, maybe an unplanned for an expense. Some of the worst crises in life are the relational crises that we endure within our marriages or, or with our children who perhaps one is wayward. Or within our families or within our relationships. And all of us have or will at some point in our lives, we will face a health crisis. Right? And what's the first thing that we do? What is, what's the first thing that we do? The first thing that we tend to do is to look in every direction for a natural solution that is ready at hand. Now here it happens to be this pool of water that Israel could see just over the horizon. 
But what happened? That, that natural solution to their problem, the, the solution that they could see, that they could feel, that they could taste, that natural solution failed them. It was no help. And we'll consider in a moment how God's people reacted to that calamity. But first we need to learn the primary lesson that this crisis was meant to teach the children of Israel and us. And it is this. That when God's people find themselves in crises and we, and we look to the natural solutions that are ready at hand to help, that we will often find that those natural solutions are no help. And that we are supposed to realize that the Lord has led us to this place. The Lord did that. He brought me here. As the Lord reveals in verse 25, He leads us into those kinds of places, into those kinds of situations to put us to the test. There He tested them. And this shows us that God's children are God's students also. He tests us. And what are tests for? What are tests for, young people? Well, we know that tests are meant to show us not only what we do know, but perhaps more importantly, what we don't know. What we, can't, what we have not yet learned. And the Lord said in Deuteronomy chapter 8 through Moses, he said that he tested Israel in the wilderness to show them what was in their hearts. They didn't know. Do you know what's in your heart? Do, do you know how much sin and unbelief there is in your heart? Do you know how much, just how much you are an enemy of God by nature in your heart? Do you know that? No, we don't. We don't know it. God has to show us what is in our hearts. And so he, he tests us, and his tests are meant to teach us what we haven't yet learned about him. They're meant to teach us what we think we know about him, but we're wrong about him. The Lord leads us into trials, and our reactions to those trials prove that our ways are not his ways. And that we need to learn from him. We need to be taught by Him and by His grace. We need His power in our lives. And, and this should teach us something very important. The, the way that we react to trials and, and, and troubles in this life, it should take, it should remind us that the Lord is leading us. When we react to trials and troubles, it should show us that we are mindful of the fact that God led us there. That he is the one testing it. So think about it. Think about your trials just now. Whether they're past trials or present trials or perhaps trials that you see often to the distance. Think about the trials that you, you have in your marriage, in your family. Contemplate the trouble that you're having, whether it is with your health, with your finances, with your children, with the uncertainty of your own future, perhaps? What should be our first thought when we consider our trials? We should, we should, this should be our first thought. The Lord is leading me. My God is leading me. He's testing me. The issue that's causing me trouble isn't the matter of first importance. To the Lord, what matters most is your heart in the midst of the trial and what is revealed to you through your response to the trial. He's testing you to show you whether you live by faith or by sight. He's testing you so that we can discover, is our hope in this life, is our hope in the things of this world, or is our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the life to come? He's testing us to show us, do, do we treasure Christ or do we store up treasures here on earth? Do, do we want to get our own way? Are, are we okay with remaining our old sinful selves? Are, are you or are you desiring to walk in God's ways and to become like the Lord Jesus Christ? 
our reactions to the tests that the Lord leads us into will answer those questions for us. And we might wish it wasn't so, but sadly, we can hear ourselves in Israel's reaction to the Lord's test here, right? Once the children of Israel knew that the water they could see, feel, and taste, the water that they hoped in, was, once they realized that it wasn't going to save them, we're told that they complained against Moses, the servant of the Lord, saying, what shall we drink? Now, at first gla glance at that question, look at that question there. It seems like a reasonable question, doesn't it? It's been three days since they last saw water, and now they are out of it. Right? We know this. If they don't get water soon, they are going to die. A person can live without water um, about three days. But I don't know if, that, if you'd last that long three days out in the desert with no water. If they don't get water soon, they will die. And Moses has been maintaining all along that it is the Lord's plan to take them to a land of promise, a land that he's described as a land flowing with milk and honey. That's the Lord's revealed plan. So you might think the question, what shall we drink, is, is a pretty good question. It's even a reasonable question. But God's word tells us here, look, it tells us that that question is a complaint. It's a complaint against the servant of God, which is the same thing as saying it's a complaint against God himself. They're grumbling. They, they're murmuring against the Lord and his servant. The, quest, the, the question is the murmur. It is the complaint against the Lord. What is it about this question that is a form of sinful grumbling? Well, we know it, this question must be then an expression of unbelief. It's an expression of a lack of faith. This particular question tells us that Israel looked around and they couldn't see the source of water that was going to save them, and so they believed that they were doomed. They're as good as dead. The question, what shall we drink, is a complaint then that alleges that the Lord is limited by the resources that we have at hand. The things that we can see with our own eyes. Asking what shall we drink is really the same thing as saying, there's nothing to drink, so now we are going to die. The Lord can't rescue us from this. Perhaps the Lord has brought us out here to die. We're going to actually hear them say that in future chapters. The question they should have asked, the question that we should ask in our trials is, how is the Lord going to work this for my good? That's the question his word teaches us to ask when we are faced with trials and troubles is, how is the Lord going to use this for my good? If they had believed in the Lord as we should, they would have said, I can't wait to see how the Lord's going to get us out of this one. It doesn't matter what I can see. It doesn't matter what I have ready at hand. The Lord has his ways and they are not my ways. The Lord is not limited, you guys, by, by the natural resources that are at our disposal. His power and His wisdom, they are infinite. And He puts all of His wisdom and all of His power into protecting His people. And He shows us this in, we sang Psalm 121, which is, is a promise from God that no evil will harm us, will be able to harm us. No, there is no evil that we can meet within this life that will thwart God working His perfect plans out for us. Not one thing. Not one thing. In fact, we have the promise of His Word that all of the evil that might befall us in this life, that it will only turn out for our salvation. And so when we react to trials with grumbling and complaining, we only reveal that we don't know 
who the Lord is for us. We don't know him very well. And so we, we need to be in the school of Christ. We need him to test us. We need him to prove to us what is in our hearts. So that we can see that, 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 he, that we can learn that, and come to believe that the Lord is our God. That he is the one leading us. He is the one working for our good. He is able to take every trial and trouble and, and work it out for our eternal good. And when we react to our troubles with fear and doubt, it, it only shows that we are thinking of life only in one dimension, and it is the dimension of personal, present happiness. Personal, present happiness. Is that the dimension through which you see all of life? It's very hard to walk with the Lord through the wilderness if you are living for personal, present happiness alone. No, Ted, or Paul Tripp likes to say, you know, we have a, a, a personal happiness paradigm for our life, but the Lord has a personal holiness paradigm for our life. And sometimes those things run into each other. But what about, and, and this is, so the other, the, the dimension through which we should view uh, the trials of life, the, the one that is of the utmost importance is the spiritual dimension, Right? Our spiritual growth in grace and in faith. That's what God is after, first of all, for us. Is our spiritual growth in grace. And so the Lord tests us as his children for the purpose of teaching us to learn how to trust in him. To learn how to live by his word. Is that not the way, ultimately, that the Lord blesses us as his people? He, he blesses us by saving us. And not just saving us, but making us like his son, Jesus Christ. If becoming like, but here's the, the, the thing. If becoming like the Lord Jesus Christ is not our highest goal in life, we're going to have a hard time following the Lord through the wilderness of this world. We're going to have a hard time. We're going to be frustrated with him. But, if becoming like Jesus Christ is our highest goal, then we will discover that no trial or trouble that we meet with in this life can hurt us. It can't, it, it can't hurt us. It can only work for our good. To live is Christ, to die is gain. In fact, that is the lesson the Lord is schooling his children in here in this passage, in verses 25 and 26. We need to look now at, at the Lord's response to his people's unbelief. And we're told in verse 25 that Moses cried out to the Lord. Now, presumably Moses, he cried out to the Lord for help. Now, he didn't know either how the Lord was going to meet the need of the present moment. But he knew that the Lord was the one to ask about it. And that's important. And we're told that the Lord showed him a tree. You see that there? The Lord showed him a tree. Well, the Hebrew literally says that the Lord taught him about a tree. The Lord taught him about a tree. The Hebrew verb is yara. Yara. It means to teach, to instruct. It's the Hebrew verb from which the word Torah comes from. You hear that? Yerah, Torah. And Torah is a very, very important Old Testament word. It's a very important biblical word. Torah is God's instruction. Torah, is, the word is often translated his law. It, its basic meaning, though, is, is it's the stuff that God teaches us. That's his Torah to us. And... The Torah, this means that the Lord didn't just show Moses then a piece of wood. It's very important to, to understand that, Mo, that the Lord taught Moses about a piece of wood. He taught Moses that if he cast this piece of wood into the bitter waters, the waters would be made sweet. This is a piece of God's instruction. It's a, it's a piece of his Torah. 
verse 25 says that with the instruction about the piece of wood that the Lord was, you see it there? He was making a statute and ordinance for his children to follow. And, and the statute or ordinance is part of the test. You see that in verse 25? That means that the Lord was making known what he was making known here to Moses and what he is teaching to all of the children of Israel, what he is teaching to us um, is what we are to learn in God's school. It's the teaching about the tree, the Torah of the tree. The Torah of the tree was a statute and an ordinance, we're told. That means it is a teaching that should be learned by all of his people when they are tested by the Lord through all of the trials and troubles of life. It's not just for these people, it's for all of us. It's the teaching about the, the tree, and it's summarized by the Torah of verse 26. If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments, and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Again, this is the Torah of the tree. It's, it's summarized here in that statute. And to understand the Torah of the tree and how it healed the bitter waters, we, we must first remember that according to chapter 1, verse 14, Israel was just being brought out by the Lord out of what? Out of bitter bondage. The bitterness of bondage. And according to Pharaoh's Torah, to Pharaoh's instruction, uh, people's lives were sustained by him. He was the God of Egypt. And he had the, the God of the Nile River at his disposal to give a source of life to people. And we talked about this in, uh, when we were dealing with the plagues, the instruction, uh, uh, what all of that meant for the children of Israel. And what it meant is that if, if Pharaoh and his Nile were your life, it was a bitter life. It was a bitter life to have Pharaoh as your God. That was the lesson, part of the lesson of Egypt. And so the, the teaching of the bitter waters of Marah and of the Lord's tree is this. That the, the way of life that the world taps into, it only creates bitterness of life. And it leaves one with a deadly thirst. But the Lord teaches us about a way of living that is not bitter and deadly. Rather, it is sweet and it is prosperous. It is the way of heeding the Lord's voice because he is your God. The, this sweet and prop, prosperous way of the Lord is, a, a, first of all, in verse 26 we see about heeding the voice of the Lord and knowing that he is your God and, and that he is, he is right always. And he, he does what is right in his sight. And if you're taught this lesson, then it makes sense that you would desire the, the sweetness of serving the Lord instead of the bitterness of following Pharaoh. That you would want the sweetness of serving God rather than the, the bitterness of serving sin and serving this world. The, the Torah of the tree is that if you give ear to all of his commandments and keep all of his statutes you will not be judged and destroyed like the Lord did through the plagues that he brought on Egypt. And every test that the Lord brings us to, it calls us for, for us to respond in faith, to respond by putting our faith to work, by obeying all of his statutes, all of his ways, if we want to escape the bitterness of living like the sin-cursed Egyptians. In other words, the Torah of the tree is that God's people must be righteous in God's sight if we want to escape the bitter curses that came upon Egypt. Faith and obedience are urged 
here as the way to escape the bitterness of being condemned with the world. And that means that the Lord is teaching us here that no one is getting into the promised land without being righteous in God's sight. If your faith and obedience is not perfect and complete, you will die in the bitterness of sin along with the Egyptians. The good news is, that's not all that the Torah of the tree teaches us. The Torah of the tree teaches us that the Lord tests our faith and he proves that we have not heeded the voice of the Lord our God as we ought. And by that lesson, he will prove himself to be the Lord, we see here, the Lord who heals us. The Lord who heals us of the deadly disease of sin and unbelief. The Lord tests us by trials and what happens? We prove that we are still living more like slaves of sin than we are sons of the Lord's sweet liberty. And when his Torah teaches us that, the Lord heals us by the tree that makes bitter things sweet. We see this is the Torah of the tree, that it's not our faith and obedience by which we escape the bitter bondage of sin. It is the faith in obedience that is foreshadowed by the tree that made the waters of Mara sweet. And friends, this tree that is foreshadowed here is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. We, it is a tree of faith and obedience to the Word of God. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. The New Testament writers take great pains to, to demonstrate for us that Jesus Christ has become our righteousness. And that, as Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 says, that Jesus... He learned obedience through the things that he suffered. In other words, the test of God came down upon the Son of God too as he stood in our place. Now, why do you think it is that the Gospels tell us about the suffering and the testing that Jesus went through? Now, why was Jesus... After his baptism, why was he led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days? Where he would hunger and he would thirst as he was tempted to sin by the devil. Why did his faith and obedience take Jesus to the cross? And why, when Jesus was on the cross, did he cry out, I thirst, before he was given bitter vinegar wine to drink right before he died for his faith and obedience. You guys, we're told these things about our Savior Jesus Christ because we're meant to see that he did it for us. This is, the, this is what fulfills the, the Torah of the tree. It, it's what Jesus Christ would do that would end the bitterness of sin, that when God's testing, the bitterness of sin that is revealed in our hearts, when God tests us, and what do we respond with? But with more unbelief and disobedience. And we're taught in Scripture that it is by Christ's stripes, by His cross, that we are healed. And that's why our forefathers were right to call the tests that the Lord puts us through the school of Christ. The, the testing is not just to show us what is in our hearts, but to show us that we need what Jesus Christ has done for us. If we are going to make it through the wilderness of this world and enter the land of promise and be rewarded with an eternal inheritance. And so we're meant to look at the cross of Jesus Christ and we're meant to look at our own un, unbelief and disobedience. And see that the the bitterness of responding to the Lord with unbelief and disobedience is healed by 
the cross of Jesus Christ. Or not only he paid the penalty for our responses to God and his tests upon us, but we see the sight of our sin and unbelief and we taste the sweetness of Christ's faith and obedience to the Father. How sweet it is to read in the pages of the New Testament how Jesus made himself a servant and he served our God and our our Father even to the point of death, the death of the cross. And he never murmured once. No complaint. He said, your will be done. And what could be sweeter than that? I think there is something sweeter here for us, even than that. Even the fact that Jesus has uh, paid for the guilt of our sin. There is another aspect of the Torah of this healing tree. The Lord teaches us that he heals us by the cross of Jesus Christ. And he makes his cross sweet to us, not just by showing us that it's what overcomes the bitterness of our sin, but the way that it beckons us into living the kind of life that Christ lived. And we see this, that Jesus' death on the cross, it teaches us that trusting in and obeying God is infinitely sweeter than anything that this world might offer to us as an alternative to living a life of faith and obedience to God. And think about it, young people. Think about who Jesus was. Jesus was the, the wisest and most powerful man who ever lived. If Think about it. If he had refused to take up his cross in faith and obedience to God, think about the kind of life he could have made for himself rather than going to the cross. But he didn't choose the way that way. He chose the way of faith and obedience. He chose to die in thirst on the cross, not because he was a fool. He did it because he knew that there is nothing sweeter than knowing God and walking with him in faith and obedience wherever he might lead. It's only after Jesus embraced the thirst and the bitterness of the cross, that God raised him from the dead and gave him the name which is above every name. The Lord, and, and this is part of how, what the, how the Lord heals his people through the cross. He does it by teaching us that life is never sweeter than when we carry the cross of the trials and troubles that the Lord has given to us. And to carry it with joy knowing that our Heavenly Father is only doing us good. Are you experiencing trials and troubles? If you don't know the Lord, your troubles are meant to humble you. Your troubles are meant to show you that you are not in control, that you are not a God to be worshipped and obeyed. And the Lord is... Is he getting through to you? That you should repent and and put your trust in the one true and living God and in his son, Jesus Christ. If you do not know Jesus as your savior, the troubles of this life are nothing in comparison to what is coming on the day of judgment. But if you are trusting in Jesus Christ as your savior, Your trials and troubles teach you this sweet truth that you have been enrolled in the most prestigious school on the planet. The Lord is testing you in the school of Christ. And if you have been sleeping during class, then ask him to wake you up. Ask him to heal you by teaching you all of the sweet lessons of the Torah of the tree. That there is no bitterness uh, in this life that the Lord does not heal by his presence with us as he carries us through all the way 
to the new heavens and the new earth and to that great promised land. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we are eager to learn from you, Father, and we do confess how uneager we are to learn it, though, the way that you have designed to teach it to us. And so we pray, asking you to make us willing to receive from you uh, whatever you have ordained for us and to look for the sweetness that you will bring about in our lives as you both show us the cross of Jesus Christ as uh, the payment for our complaining and murmuring and, and wishing that you would just leave us alone, but also to look to Christ's cross and to see the way of life that is best and sweetest And Lord, may we take up our cross as you have called us to do with the anticipation that you will do us good and that you will bless us. And we ask you for this grace in Jesus' name. Amen.